a biblical profile. When we select and appoint spiritual leaders, we are to use a biblical profile of maturity. Here's Gene. What we have listed for us here is a pathetic picture. It is really an illustration of why Israel was in such desperate straits throughout the people of Israel. Because what we have here is a very sad commentary on those who are supposed to be spiritual leaders, the priests, including Eli himself. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. They are priests. No wonder Israel was in trouble. They had no regard for the priest's share of the sacrifices from the people. When any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged meat fork while the meat was boiling and plunge it into the container or kettle or cauldron or cooking pot. The priest would claim for himself whatever the meat fork brought up. And he wasn't supposed to do that. And this is the way they treated all the Israelites who came there to Shiloh. They didn't just treat certain individuals that way. They treated everybody that way. They were very wicked men. We read on a little later in the passage. You get down to verses 22 to 26. You see, it, it, uh, it's, it's worse. Now, Eli was very old. He heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel. He heard about it. And how they were sleeping with the women who served the interests of the tent of meeting. I mean, not only was there incredible, incredible selfishness in relationship to the way in which they were supposed to handle the offerings, their selfishness and providing the best for themselves, but they're literally engaging in incredible immorality right there in the temple, right there in Shiloh. It's no wonder Israel was in trouble. And he said to them, Why are you doing these things? I have heard about your evil actions from all these people. No, my sons, the report I hear from the Lord's people is not good. If a man sins against another man, God can intercede for him. But if a man sins against the Lord the way you're doing it, who can intercede for him? And the fact of the matter is, they would not listen to their father since the Lord intended to kill them. Now that's a very difficult statement. And that's not saying that God decided He was going to kill them, therefore He wouldn't let them change their behavior. Because that would lead to a person saying, I'm living in sin because you designed me to live in sin. God didn't do that. Somehow, here we have God's sovereignty and free will in a way we can't explain it. The fact is, they were living in sin and God dealt with them in a very severe way. We'll see that later. But notice, by contrast, I love this, by contrast, the boy Samuel grew in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. And that's an amazing thing to me, how this little boy, under Eli's tutelage, could literally grow up and and live for God when he had these incredible bad models that he saw every day and saw what Eli's sons were doing. I think it shows the influence of Eli on this little boy's life in spite of the fact that Eli was violating the will of God and we'll see that he paid a horrible price for that as well. This is a powerful principle as we see underscored in the New Testament. Now, one of the reasons these men were living this way is they did not have a relationship with God, even though they were priests. They were not circumcised in their heart. They were circumcised physically as sons of Eli and as priests, but they were not circumcised of heart. And Paul talked about that in Romans chapter 2 when he said, On the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart by the Spirit, not the letter. His praise is not from men, but from God. See, physical circumcision was never a substitute for a relationship with God. And Paul made it very clear that even in the Old Testament, all of them 
men and women should be circumcised in their hearts. This was a symbol that God used in the Old Testament to set apart men in Israel, but behind that symbol was circumcision of heart, which applies to every human being in terms of what God's will is in coming into relationship with Jesus. Romans principle 5 says, To have salvation, we must go through a born-again experience that renews our hearts. Obviously, the sons of Eli did not have that kind of experience. And that's one reason they were living such wicked lives. They had no regard for the Lord. And sadly, even among leaders in the New Testament church, there were individuals who were not circumcised in their hearts. For example, Acts 20, verses 29 to 30, says, I know that after my departure, Paul said to the Ephesian elders, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. There will be those individuals, but men from among yourselves will rise up with deviant doctrines to lure the disciples into following them. And as Paul looked out at the Ephesian elders meeting with them there, he knew that some of those men didn't really know God personally. Because later they would rise up with deviant doctrines to lure disciples into following them. So even in the New Testament, we see uh, the problem emerging that created problems in the church. And, and Paul had to address those issues when he wrote his letters to Timothy. And Timothy had the challenge of dealing with some of those very serious situations. Sometimes I, I just can't understand and comprehend how young Timothy could deal with these issues in the way that he did. It's very clear that this principle, this principle of uh, selecting and appointing spiritual leaders based on maturity is, is clearly outlined in the New Testament. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, just part of that passage reads, an overseer, an elder, a pastor, therefore must be above reproach, that is, have a good reputation. How do you develop that reputation? You're a man of one woman, a husband of one wife. Moral purity that we looked at earlier. Self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, or here it's translated an able teacher. To be honest with you, I like able to teach is a little better translation. And that simply means having a sense of gentleness and sensitivity in our communication, in spite of the fact we have to deal with serious issues. Not addicted to wine, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. And you can go on and you can read other uh, specific character qualities that are outlined in these passages of Scripture. And what a contrast this is to what we see in the Old Testament in terms of some of the leaders. We see it in the Judges, throughout the book of Judges, and uh, the fact that even though they were chosen to lead Israel, they weren't qualified spiritually. And one reason they weren't qualified, God put them in those positions, God had no one to choose other than in His sovereignty to choose someone, even a Samson, who failed God miserably, and yet God chose leaders based on the fact that He was going to deliver Israel because they were praying for that deliverance. But in the New Testament, we don't have any excuses because it's very clear that in spiritual leadership, we need to have mature men and women leading us. So the question is basically, in what specific ways can we discover and select leaders in our churches who reflect the character of the Lord Jesus Christ? And a, a simple answer to that is that we really need, number one, to model this character. Those of us who are in leadership, modeling it for others, and as Timothy heard from Paul, the things Paul said that you've heard from me, Timothy, commit to other faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In other words, we model it and we teach it. And we demonstrate what this character is all about. And when I became involved in church planting, myself, one of the things that really hit me very, very quickly 
was that we need to develop men in our churches that reflect these qualities, along as well as men, women as well. But I began with a group of men, and we began to study these qualities together. Now, I didn't realize when we started that that I would write a book called The Measure of a Man based on these qualities. And that was fascinating how that book came into existence because Bill Gregg with Riggle Books was in town and he heard about our church and wanted to have a meeting with me to find out what was going on. And he said, Gene, what, what, what's going on? Tell me. And I said, well, one of the things is I'm meeting with a group of men and we're studying these qualities from 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. And I'd, been to, I'd begun to journal what we were learning together as a group of men, about 25 of us, meeting weekly. And he looked at what I had journaled, and he said, Gene, that's a book. Would you write a book on that subject? And I said, well, I need to pray about it. Well, he pulled out a contract right then, and he said, I want you to write a book. By the way, that's an author's uh, dream, because to get a book published is very difficult today, because there's so many books that are wanting to be published. And he's asking me to do the book, saying, here's a contract, sign it. Well, I prayed about it, and I did eventually write a book called The Measure of a Man based on these qualities, not realizing how God was going to use it. But one of the answers to the question in relationship to this principle is that we've got to take seriously those qualities. And as I look back at my own ministry and church planning, I would say one of the most basic foundational secrets to developing a church is to take those qualities seriously for men and women who are in leadership so they can model it for others because those qualities are what create unity and commitment within that church. And once we fail to take seriously these qualities and we get individuals in leadership who are not qualified, that can lead to the destruction of a church. And sometimes all it takes is just one individual who's powerful in a powerful position can destroy a church. And so this is a very, very, very important principle that we need to take very seriously. Let me read the statement again. Here's the principle. When we select and appoint spiritual leaders, we're to use a biblical profile of maturity. And that biblical profile is spelled out very clearly in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 3, not only for men, but for women in leadership roles. Titus chapter 2, not just for men who are in leadership, chapter 1, but women who are godly, who can train and teach other women to be godly. And so we see these profiles very specifically outlined for us in the New Testament, and we need to take them very, very seriously.